So I would like to welcome you all actually to this event. It is organized from Jean Monnet European Union Public Diplomacy in collaboration with uh, Digital Communication Global Network and uh, World Learning. Uh, that it is uh, actually an initiative uh, that we have started from uh, March actually as part of the larger digital communication network, which is a global organization with uh, 7,000 members. Uh, we have the support of uh, world learning uh, and actually the citizens uh, of educational and exchanges office from the state department. Today's uh, webinar, it is organized as we have said before in cooperation and collaboration with Jean Monnet Chair on European Union Public Diplomacy, which is a chair that has been uh, awarded in our uh, school and uh, specifically to Professor Franco Nicolopoulos Christos. It is actually uh, a distinction since it is a recognition of excellence, of teaching and research excellence. And uh, as Aristotle University, we are honored to have um, these are monet chairs in our department, but equally to, whole, to the university as well. Um, be, before I start, I would like uh, firstly to thank our uh, rector, uh, Nik Nikos Papayuanu. Uh, just to give you an idea, Aristotle University is the biggest university in Greece, and having the rector to open uh, this actually webinar, it is uh, of a great honor. I will start with the rector and then uh, we'll, we will move on with our uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, rector, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear professors, uh, dear distinguished guests. Um, I, it's great uh, pleasure for me and great honor to participate in uh, this uh, webinar, which is organized uh, uh, by our department. Um, and for this reason, uh, as the university, we are really very proud uh, because of the work uh, is doing in uh, this department. So uh, during the last decade, uh, the European Union is often misunderstood and uh, seen in negative terms. The crisis of the Eurozone, the refugee crisis and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic have underlined this debate. While the health, economic, and social dim dimensions of the crisis have understandably attracted the most attention, attention in policy and analytical debates, the pandemic's political implications are also likely to be significant. In addition, the coronavirus is set to go down in Europe's history as a major catalyst for more and a different kind of integration. Bearing that in mind, I and the audience are more than happy to hear your positions on how the current, the current crisis can be an opportunity to reframe the discussion on the future of European integrations, as well as the global role, role of the European Union uh, portraying uh, through public diplomacy and also how the European Union through public diplomacy can be portrayed and framed not as game between member states with national interests, but more as a community with shared interests. With these uh, ideas, uh, thanks again for this invitation to your webinar and uh, Many uh, uh, congratulations again for this scientific event. Thank you very much. Director, thank you very much for opening actually this event for, for us, for everyone. It is important to have the support of the whole university to these activities, but also underlines the importance to promote this scientific collaboration as it is witnessed from our uh, panel. I will start by introducing our panel actually and our distinguished speakers. Uh, it is Christos Franco Nicolopoulos, who is a professor and the vice president in our department and actually uh, a holder of the, the second Jean Monnet chair. Together with us, it 
is uh, Dr. Stefan Bay Rasmussen. He is Director of Studies of uh, Master Degree in Europe Culture, Department of International Relations, Faculty of Social and Human Sciences, University of Bilbao. As I can understand from his surname, Dr. Rasmussen uh, preferred to leave Denmark, Denmark behind and uh, live in Bilbao, if I'm not <laughs> wrong, Professor. Then we have together with us Georgos Kostakos, who is a co-founder and executive director of the Brussels-based foundation for global governance and sustainability and former climate action thematic coordinator at NEMO. As you can understand, the, the term of sustainability and especially in relation with uh, climate change and the environment, uh, especially as we have seen um, immediately after the inauguration of President Biden will, uh, will be placed in uh, high in the, in the agenda. And then we have Dr. Filipos Proedru, a good friend and also a senior lecturer of international relations at the Faculty of Business and Society, University of South Wales. Uh, thank you for being today with us and thank you for accepting the invitation to be part of this uh, panel. I will start with Christos. Christos, the floor is yours. Yes, I, I am not going to say a lot, but a few things so as to navigate, you know, the, 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 the discussion. Listen, <coughs> I cannot say if the pandemic will be a game changer. It's too early to say that. But certainly, you know, it is uh, operating as an accelerator. You know, it is bringing, uh, accelerating uh, existing uh, problems, uh, the tendencies that we had before the, the pandemic. Uh, those are rising distrust to institutions and the media, disinformation, everything goes, uh, alternative facts, uh, geopolitical uh, recession. In other words, uh, you know, lack of coordination and agreement on many issues uh, at, uh, at the global governance level. Uh, this raises, you know, the, the danger that uh, the pandemic then, you know, might be become, as the Munich report has suggested, a polypandemic, you know, a multifaceted uh, crisis is that, you know, will reserve, uh, reverse, sorry, years of progress on the issues of human rights, uh, development, the climate, and so on. Uh, you know, we, we feel that the pandemic is threatening to provoke a hunger pandemic, you know, uh, an inequality pandemic, uh, even a pandemic of authoritarian rule, and so on. In any case, moments of crises are always, you know, a chance, an opportunity to, to do something. And especially the pandemic, you know, it uh, exposed that our well-being, uh, as well as the well-being of others, you know, is important. And that could serve as a wake-up call. And uh, for Europe, for the European Union, it is an opportunity, you know, to, to build back uh, b better, to enhance the global governance system and, uh, you know, participate as a leader not as a superpower, but as one of the protagonists on uh, the, res the resolution of uh, global disparities, challenges, and so on. So, and I think that if it wants to do this, it needs to distinguish between conventional uh, and the global perspective. You know, we have been talking a lot about the strategic aut autonomy of the United of the European Union, and that usually has to do you know, with our relationship with the United States or NATO, if, if we should break or not break away, you know, that is conventional strategic uh, autonomy. But when we talk about global strategic autonomy, you know, the, the need is for the you know, European Union to advance a range of international policies that will not only protect her interests, you know, but also uh, policies that are based on her distinct values and interests. This is um, something, you know, the European Union should be thinking of. Now, in other words, the logic is that, you know, the European Union should not act alone. It should not close, be protective, isolated. But in developing a purpose of their own, you know, uh, it should seek cooperation 
with others, you know, to, to resolve global problems. So it's a mindset. It's, you know, uh, you have to start thinking in that direction of cooperating in multiple areas. And the question now is how to work in that direction through public diplomacy, you know? And as I and Filippos Proedru have discussed eight years ago, my God, a decade, you know? Uh, what kind of diplom public diplomacy? A, di a public diplomacy that is focused on education and culture or a public diplomacy that is focused on, you know, the mounting political fundamental issues of today, threats, you know, that are, you know, con common to all of us. And uh, we then asked ourselves, how can you engage publics through public diplomacy within and outside the European Union in an open debate? To communicate standpoints, you know, listen, reply, have counter arguments, and so on, uh, in order not only to create spaces for alternative paradigms, but also, you know, spaces for criticism to existing policies and so on. And we feel that if we were to do that through public diplomacy, perhaps, you know, the problem of accountability, transparency, and legitimacy is a major issue today for global governance as well as domestic policies might be dealt with. And this is the framework I am thinking of. Uh, and this is the framework within which I am working uh, this Jean Monet chair. And I would be very happy to see what uh, Stefan, George and Philippos think about it or how they think in this direction, you know and have a discussion at the end. Thank you very much for your participation. I am really honored. Uh, it's uh, nice to have Stefan because Stefan is one of those intellectuals I would uh, read back in the, in 2008, 2009, 2010 to, you know, to make up my mind on public diplomacy. Georgios Kostakos, uh, he's not only from the Peloponnese like I am, so we are, you know, we are, we feel like different Greeks, <laughs> but uh, he was also a fellow student of mine in the, uh, in, at the University of Kent. He did his PhD. His background is very interesting, very diverse. George finished the Polytechnic of Athens. Uh, and then he decided to study international relations. He has written uh, 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 children's stories. Uh, uh, he has worked for United Nations at very high level. Uh, and uh, he has a lot to tell us. And Philippos, now Philippos, Philippos Roedro. When I first came to university, back in 2002, he would knock on my door and he would say, I want a PhD. <laughs> I want to do a PhD, I want to do a PhD. And I would think to myself, what, what does this guy want from my life? <laughs> Any case, in the end, he won, he managed, and uh, he's uh, one, I think, of those Greek ac academics that should come back to Greece because he has a lot to offer to our uh, universities and we are doing whatever is possible to bring him back. Uh, but he, remember his name. He will, uh, he's a rising star. Uh, he has published extensively abroad uh, on uh, issues uh, regarding uh, energy, but also postulonito economy after Pukani's environmental economy. economics. Yes, ecological economics and so on. Uh, one of the few guys at global level who is de dealing with these issues. And he's also a very young father. Okay, so we may begin and I think we'll uh, give, I don't know if Nikos uh, agrees, we can, uh, Nico, we can begin with Stefan. Yes? We're going to keep the Greek line of uh, tradition, philoxenia, 
hospitality to foreigners and we'll give him the floor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes. First of all, of course, uh, I wanted to begin by, by thanking you for allowing me to be part of this uh, exquisite company. Um, I want to thank both the Aristotle University. Um, I'm honored to be here also uh, with your inauguration of, of, of the rector. And of course, also to, to the Jean Monetier for taking this, uh, I think, um, very necessary initiative um, to get a dialogue on EU public diplomacy. Uh, in these challenging times. Um, thank you also very much for the introductions. Um, so, um, I mean, as uh, Christos has already mentioned, we're dealing with these tremendous uh, challenges at the moment. So um, I'm not sure how to go and think about all that. So what I wanted to share with you uh, today is a model that I'm currently working on. Uh, for how to make sense of some of all these, um, some of all these uh, complexities. Um, so I will uh, now uh, share uh, my screen with you. Um, I hope you can see this. We can see it. We can see it. Yes. Basically, uh, in terms of the current challenges. Uh, recently, I've been reading a lot uh, upon the concept of ontological security um, because I think it's a way that we can use to um, assess uh, public diplomacy that might help us understand uh, why the European Union is acting as it is and perhaps also some of the possible future avenues. So um, this is basically a model I want to share with you here. Uh, maybe you're convinced that it's useful or at least Hopefully I can provoke uh, some thoughts uh, in you of why you think it's absolutely uh, not worth uh, the time and effort. Uh, however, um, I hope you will uh, bear with me. So I will briefly introduce the model, uh, give a few examples and end up with a few um, recommendations in the very end. Um, parting from this uh, rather common sense a definition of a public diplomacy in terms of influencing uh, foreign publics, but also a, a matter of uh, sharing values, uh, sharing uh, political priorities. Um, the focus is mainly on uh, foreign publics, um, but of course in the EU context, uh, particularly uh, with all kinds of actors, but particularly in the EU context, um, there is, of course, no real way of distinguishing internal from external audiences. Um, and I think also we always have to keep this in mind um, that a lot of the communication, um, we only have to look at uh, the use budgets for political communication, um, that the main thrust is really with EU citizens in terms of uh, gathering legitimacy, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about um, the foreign publics, um, we always have to be a little bit critical and keeping in mind the the internal audience, which is always at least implicitly uh, there um, somehow. So I want to start from uh, the concept of ontological security um, to understand uh, public diplomacy. Um, the reading I've been doing is in the version of uh, Giddens, uh, Anthony Giddens, who's formulating this in terms of having a stable and positive view of self um, and ability uh, to maintain order and continuity and ability to interpret our current self-perception with our past experiences, our current actions and expectations uh, for the future. Um, other authors such as Brent Steele, Jennifer Mitson have also uh, applied this concept to international politics. Um, and I find it uh, very useful to understand a public diplomacy here. The idea is that any kind of actor uh, is motivated not only by physical security, military security, uh, but very much uh, by ontological security. And this is something that is continuously formulated in these autobiographical narratives that um, articulate interpretations of our past, our present, external events, and our relationships with others. Um, 
it's a very complex concept. I won't go into this here. It, it draws both on social psychology um, on constructivist international relations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I want to, I want to skip ahead a little bit uh, more here um, and see what we can, why, why can we use this in uh, the study of public diplomacy? Um, the idea is that ontological security is a precondition for any kind of institutional effectiveness. Um, because other studies have shown of organizations that in the absence of being able to have this stable narrative, it leads to a disproportionate diversion of attention and resources to these identity uh, construction processes, uh, building back to uh, the inherent human need for a cognitive uh, consistency. Uh, if we don't have that, uh, this will be on the top of our mind. Um, also, uh, we see that, um, particularly when we're dealing with very large organizations, um, individuals, in this case, those working with public diplomacy, um, they will be uh, more prone to act decisively with this can-do attitude uh, if they can rely on uh, this uh, autobiographical narrative uh, that gives them a sense of order and continuity, and it will definitely help them design specific uh, political uh, communication lines. Uh, that resonate with deeper discourses on EU being and uh, EU doing. Uh, so uh, in this sense, um, I interpret or I suggest that we can analyze EU public diplomacy uh, in terms of the attempt by the European Union to achieve ontological security uh, by the construction of narratives that link um, the EU's being uh, with uh, the EU is doing with its policies, uh, thereby covering both this autobiography, bi uh, but also the justification for a specific foreign policy. Um, I believe this is very universal. Any kind of actor will necessarily engage in this. But of course, uh, the European Union is very special. Uh, it doesn't enjoy this uh, automatic legitimacy um, that a state uh, does. It doesn't need to justify its own existence continuously to its audiences, uh, mainly its internal audiences, and it doesn't need to explain uh, what kind of unidentified political object it really is um, uh, to foreign audiences. The EU is tasked with this tremendous um, uh, challenge uh, all the time. So therefore, uh, it's continuously presented with these questions regarding, so what is the EU basically about? Um, which is of course, possibly the ones working with uh, EU public diplomacy will find these questions the most hard um, to answer. <clears throat> so if we apply this concept of ontological security, um, the analysis is not much uh, here. I come from an international relations background um, and I very much like these webinars in part because, um, or other kinds of discussions where in the terms of public diplomacy, we can also engage with communication professionals to see things from a different angle. Um, but here, I, I, I won't try to see so much in terms of techniques, what should be done, uh, but focus on how uh, the EU as a public diplomacy actor sees itself how it argues its policy choices and interprets uh, external events in order to construct um, ontological security. Um, I think we can break this down. Um, ontological security in, in order to talk about effective public diplomacy, um, it becomes a matter of a coherence between these different levels in the autobiographic narrative. Um, here, um, I work with these uh, four different kinds of dimensions, uh, the co coherence among which will then be um, a measure of the coherence and thereby the effectiveness of a public diplomacy uh, narrative. On a very basic uh, level, we are talking about um, identity, about the self-perception, about the historical experience, uh, we're talking also about negative identification, the construction of others as probably one of the most important elements of this narrative. Um, on another level of a, of a um, different level, we talk about causality, the causal ideas that are present. 
So what is it basically that makes the world go round? What is it that causes um, peace, that causes uh, welfare uh, in international politics? And of course, if we have these ideas about how the world works, coupled with our self-perception, our historical experiences, that should lead us to the formulation of uh, strategy, the formulation of specific policy objectives, um, which then on a lower level of abstraction can be seen in terms of tactics. And this is where we come into the formulation of uh, specific policies um, and communication lines. Um, and the point of the model is that clarity on these four different levels, uh, it, the tactical level, the strategic level, um, the level of um, the cause, causality and the level of self-perception, um, this is what will greatly enhance the potential effectiveness of um, a public uh, diplomacy uh, communication line. So um, applying this uh, general model uh, to the European Union, um, I think, I mean, uh, there are many different ways to organize this uh, information, uh, but I would say we could at least distinguish three, three different kinds of autobiographical narratives um, that give rise to different kinds of um, policy, strategic policy objectives and different kinds of uh, communication lines will feed back into and strengthen um, these EU beings or they will contribute to destabilize them. Um, on one hand, we have um, the EU as an international organization. Um, this is about how the EU adds value to the actions of the member states. Uh, it's about legitimacy. Um, it's about the community method versus the open method of coordination. It's about supranationalism versus intergovernmentalism. Um, and this added value to the member states. Um, the dominant, I would say, uh, narrative uh, in the EU case is that, uh, which has also been called the founding myth uh, of the EU, um, as being this structural solution to uh, the Westphalian logics, the nationalism, uh, the competitiveness, um, and a universal model for peace based on overcoming this uh, negative aspects of anarchy, uh, reaching this sort of, let's say, Kantian community um, of perpetual peace. Um, where the EU, of course, also couples this with universality, that it's not a particularly European phenomenon, and there's no cultural essentialism here, uh, but universality. And this, of course, also what gives rise to this whole body of literature on EU normative power, civilian power, ethical power, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think we can distinguish at least one more main uh, biographical nar autobiographical narrative, which is about the EU as a polity, um, a quasi-federal, we could add a uh, polity here, um, which is about the united in diversity. Um, it's about a union, which is a new polity. It's not just a post-Westphalian unidentified object. Uh, it has borders, there are insiders, uh, there are outsiders. Um, and um, there is this underlying logic that the EU must um, sort of uh, get its business together to act effectively together uh, in a competitive uh, multipolar world. So all these uh, narratives and, and, and for sure more, um, they coexist, uh, they partially overlap, they partially contradict each other um, and any kind of public diplomacy initiative uh, will necessarily feed back into uh, these kind of constructions. Um, if we break them down a little bit, and uh, I illustrate the model here, um, if we look at the founding myth, um, this is very much about the EU defining its own, pa uh, its own past as the other, uh, the nationalisms of the 30s, uh, the Holocaust, the Second World War, um, and how integration multilateralism, human rights, and all these political values that the EU defines in its treaties, the diplomatic principles of regionalization, institutionalization of the diplomatic exchange, um, of regional integration uh, is a universal method for overcoming all these negative elements of the Westphalian system. 
this in turn leads to certain causal ideas about how do we achieve a better world? What should we be doing here? Um, it's of course about uh, regional integration, multilateralism, institutionalization as diplomatic principles that leads to uh, peace and prosperity coupled with the EU's own values, um, political values, good governance, human rights, the rule of law, uh, democracy uh, as they're commonly defined. As foreign policy strategy, um, this also means that um, the EU model, because it is universal, um, should of course be exported somehow. That means that we get this um, systemic policy goals. They're not necessarily relational. Uh, there's not a view on the world in zero-sum games. Um, so the EU, uh, in this sense, has as foreign policy strategy. This is very obvious, both most like uh, most obviously in the 2003 uh, European Security Strategy, but also partially in the 2016 uh, EU Global Strategy. Although perhaps with a smaller, a lower level of ambition here, um, but it's really about uh, trying to bring some of these uh, um, aspects of European integration uh, beyond uh, EU EU borders. Um, again, then, um, in terms of specific communication initiatives, um, they will be surrounding EU political values um, such as human rights. And the abolition of the death penalty has been very successful, but also communicating um, surrounding regional integration. Um, the value of this, we see it also in EU diplomatic initiatives to try to interact with other parts of the world on a regional basis. Um, and if we talk about, for example, a, a sort of a model a public diplomacy event um, that, that ties in with all of this, it could be, for example, a film festival where uh, different European countries project um, films uh, based on their national cultures uh, with the EU ambassador uh, then uh, coming in, giving a speech about um, um, how cultural uh, diversity is celebrated and there's no obstacle uh, to a kind of integration, political economic integration that brings with it um, all these benefits uh, in Europe. Um, so this would be a, a, an example of, of how we could use this uh, model. I will try to outline as well a second example of a, the counter narrative, um, if you could say, or, or at least a different and alternative narrative of the EU as a quasi-federal policy, uh, polity and effective actor which stresses, yes, so the EU is a new kind of polity um, with its own experience, um, but it is also, it has its distinct interests, um, not least uh, in uh, economic terms due to the exclusive competence in the common commercial policy. So the EU is also an entity that necessarily needs to defend its own interest um, uh, in a competitive uh, world. The causal ideas are here about how this joint action is necessary for a global voice. The member states are too small to go it individually. Uh, the EU needs to join together. Um, we see these um, we see these constructions very often in the political debate. So in this case, how do we um, do this? It's about concerted action by the EU external action service or by or by the commissions, which is necessary um, to defend European interests to protect. Uh, peace in Europe and uh, prosperity uh, in Europe. If we talk about uh, strategy, this is not about systemic goals. Uh, it's about relational goals. Uh, we have more tendency to see maybe not the world in zero sum games, but in plus sum games where there are advantages to be had uh, if we are um, concerted diplomats. So um, the policy goals will be about achieving advantageous trade agreements, um, uh, agreements with third states to keep migrants out, and in other way, uh, defend uh, EU material interests. Um, and we see this also in EU public diplomacy uh, in all its communication lines uh, that emphasizes the added value of EU action, the EU's ability to achieve results, um, and this is where I very much suspect that this is meant for a, a domestic internal EU audience, uh, this consumption, um, as, the, as any EU official must continuously justify 
um, the spending of money uh, and resources by the EU instead of by member states. So we see this um, about you know getting the COVID vaccines negotiated by Europe, uh, by the EU, uh, striking these migration deals with third countries, with Turkey, uh, with Libya, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as a, an actor that actually um, protects uh, Europe interests. Um, we have um, difficulties with both of these uh, narratives. And one of the things I want to communicate is how they are both being challenged, uh, challenged by uh, current uh, crisis. This very utopian, let's say optimistic, idealistic narrative of the EU as a source, uh, as a model uh, for the world is of course challenged by um, all these external events um, that makes it uh, take a lot of unnecessary, un unpopular and perhaps not very uh, normative decisions. But on the other hand, we also have this effective actor discourse, which is also challenged uh, obviously uh, by um, the lack of agreement within the EU on the most um, difficult political issues. Um, and uh, the idea is here, of course, that um, what disturbs all these autobiographical narratives leads to a change in policy is ultimately um, the external events. A practitioner will always uh, try to or strive for a, a cognitive consistency by feeding into a pre-established uh, narratives, uh, but we see in this moment that the EU is being moved by uh, these external events, and this is also why I found this um, title of the conference particularly um, stimulating, you know, because the, the COVID um, virus is, is it's not only about vaccines, uh, but it really is this external event that shows us something about which kind of polity the EU is and therefore what it needs to communicate in its um, public diplomacy. Um, in, in, in my reading, there's been this huge step um, in dealing with uh, the economic consequences uh, toward uh, uh, financial federalism. Um, I, I will comment a little bit on this on migration, but we can also talk about you know, cultural diplomacy, Russian hybrid warfare, um, the EU's increased global role generally, which means it uh, needs to take a stand on contentious issues. Um, but particularly the coronavirus has been, um, on one hand, an EU coordinated action, redistribution of vaccines. Um, there's been a response to the economic consequences that have been uh, radically different from the response to the 2008 uh, crisis. Um, this has been about uh, bailing out. It has been about uh, common debts. It's been about uh, some states um, getting more out of these funds than others without having to pay them back. Um, so we really see, um, I would say, a giant leap uh, of the EU towards this um, um, federal uh, fiscal union, however we want to call it, um, that was uh, ruled out uh, only uh, 10 years ago. On one hand, this strengthens the EU as a policy, the effective actor discourse, um, and partially undermines this, um, this uh, founding uh, myth. Um, but I think also it's interesting because it's a case as an example of this general evolution of the EU towards the federal state of assuming ever more core state competences. Um, just as indicators of this, we have in the EU global strategy from 2016, uh, we have a military ambition of territorial defense which is also um, a radical step for the EU to actually do this. Um, we have the PESCO developing EU military capabilities. Um, we have this uh, buzzword of principle pragmatism where we have a reduction level of ambition. So it's not only about promoting EU values, it's actually about defending material interests. It's about promoting stability abroad rather than uh, democracy abroad. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think very much um, that what Krista said in the, in, in the beginning is right. I think this um, coronavirus pandemic is very much an accelerator of uh, different tendencies in the EU's evolution and also in EU public diplomacy um, that takes us, to, uh, that takes us to, uh, uh, towards a new scenario. 
Um, another one is, of course, uh, migration, where and the EU governance of this, where we have seen um, migration being securitized uh, by member states as a threat to the culture, uh, cohesion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, coupled with the fact that there's been a very asymmetric impact of uh, this migration. Um, I mean, from the 2015 onwards, mainly. Uh, on one hand, um, there's been a zero-sum game uh, logic within the EU, um, where there's been no solidarity, no agreement on redistribution, and insisting on this uh, double N notion of asylum seekers having to apply where they first set foot in the EU. Um, but on the other hand, what the EU has been able to do, the member states have agreed on, is hardening the external border on one hand, um, and also on externalizing um, the migration governance uh, by these agreements with third states, uh, probably, and this is my interpretation, uh, to avoid some of these more normative or ethical considerations um, by not doing it itself. But my point is here, again, is that it points, uh, as for um, um, public diplomacy, it points towards the same effect as the coronavirus crisis. Um, the EU responded, EU member states responded with unilateral solution that raised internal borders and threatened EU ontological security directly, threatening the basis, the free mobility, the Schengen area, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which explains why the EU took all these actions um, towards hardening the external border uh, to reduce the influx of migrants uh, simply to protect its own uh, internal mobility. Again, ontological security is threatened by the hardening of this very border. And this is, of course, a field full of paradoxes that I'm struggling to make sense of, um, because a hardening of an external border uh, is, of course, uh, antagonistic to uh, EU public diplomacy discourses on human rights, uh, about uh, equal uh, value of human beings, about the universality of its own experience, about the multilateral solutions uh, rather than unilateral solutions, and about integration uh, as a model instead of the pulling of borders uh, and hardening um, of borders. So this is basically in terms of migration governance, uh, giving rise to what has been called um, organized hypocrisy uh, in other academic articles. Um, but at the very least, we can say this cognitive dissonance um, by this uh, very uh, idealistic uh, um, narratives of, I don't know how your level of German is, but this is the oath to joy. Uh, all humans, all, um, all men will become brothers, uh, written, of course, um, uh, on, the, on, on, on this uh, partiture of, of, of the refugees and the barbed wire. So uh, the problem is this, uh, the gap between the EU saying or protecting and the EU doing of the protectionism. So what I detect is uh, a destabilization of the EU as a model for peace narrative, this founding myth, this traditional narrative, because of all these external events uh, coupled with the EU's own evolution, but also that the effective narrative, uh, the effective actor narrative clashes with uh, events, simply because the EU does not have the eternal cohesion to actually achieve an acceptable uh, degree of ontological uh, security here. Um, challenged by Russia, um, the need for Russian gas, asymmetric interdependence, etc. There's a logic of diversity within the EU that doesn't really uh, make it um, go forward either in terms of ontological security within this narrative. Finally, I wanted to mention also the emergence of an ontological security dilemma. Uh, where actually we've seen that EU actions, EU idealism uh, is seen as a threat by member states, uh, the Visegrad countries. Uh, we normally uh, do the bashing of Hungary and Poland, uh, but this is really very present in many EU countries um, where EU redistribution of refugees is, is seen as a direct threat to their ontological security. And of course, also uh, everything we talk about in EU foreign policy um, we talk from, or at least I talk from the point of view of the EU, but we have to recognize as well, how is this viewed in Africa? 
um, given the colonial history, uh, military power, the EU, when they say they want to build up military power, have a more concerted foreign policy. Um, how does this read? I imagine um, that uh, the benign nature is not uh, so prevalent in their perceptions as they might be in uh, European uh, official uh, speeches. So coming back to this, uh, what is it I think we can maybe use this model for? Um, I will, I will not really give you um, a, a strict conclusion, but perhaps um, suggest way forward. I think obviously these are preliminary ideas of mine that I think um, that helps me to understand uh, something of what is going on here, something about the link between the very uh, low level of abstraction. What does an EU uh, diplomat respond at a press conference to uh, these very grand questions of what is the EU and what should it be? Um, but I think this needs to be further developed. Uh, I think it, it could perhaps be developed into something that could be useful um, for designing specific public promise initiatives, obviously communications uh, experts, uh, people who know about political communication that to a level that I don't, um, they would probably need to have a look at this and help, help us with this. Um, but I think also um, this is very much developed on the basis of the EU case, like all the classical integration theories the test of this will, of course, be uh, the applicability beyond uh, this, um, this single case. In terms of EU public diplomacy, um, what can we say about this? Well, uh, a conclusion that I draw from the application of this model um, is that uh, the EU needs to identify and strengthen communications lines that uh, do not undermine the ontological security um, provided by this uh, founding myth. Um, it's about being careful with phrasings. Um, I mean, for example, such, such a thing as the death penalty campaign uh, is very innocent in the sense, um, but there is also this um, niche diplomacy that has been very much debated in terms of general EU representation where um, the EU underground in the third state, uh, it takes uh, the available positions that there are where we have um, concerted, uh, where we have agreement, uh, with the EU member states. So this could perhaps also uh, be the case here. Go about it the other way around, instead of thinking from the grand questions of identity towards specific initiatives, do it the other way around, but keeping in mind how this feeds into um, uh, deeper constructions. And going beyond a little bit, this uh, focus on strategic communication, the design of campaigns that have been implicitly um, the object of study in the application of this model, um, what I think also will ultimately enhance uh, understanding is the people-to-people -people contacts. Um, I don't know, I come from university, I will always be the first one to recommend more scholarships for students, for staff. Uh, we need to go and interact, uh, but of course not only in, a, in, in an academic environment, um, but people-to-people -people contacts that are more than sitting a week on the beach in Dubai, but actually um, give some kind of uh, on this cultural, intercultural understanding. Um, there's definitely also scope for cultural diplomacy uh, to be enhanced, uh, to bring about um, a positive view of EU, to show uh, knowledge, provide knowledge of the EU without necessarily feeding, uh, having a destabilizing effect on these deeper narratives. And then finally, what I think, what I believe also is that um, two things that the EU is probably a little bit in need of, of course, because of the present um, um, imperatives of needing to justify its own actions and its need to deal with crisis, obviously. Um, but I think um, there are a lot of virtues to this EU model. Um, and I think perhaps the EU is lacking a little bit uh, in self-esteem that uh, could be developed on a strategic level here, um, I believe in its own model. Um, but I think also a strategic patience. Um, this works on a very long time scale. Um, I was on a, I was on a, myself on a one one month uh, research stay in Oman and speaking with academics from the Gulf countries, uh, and they said, "Yes, we're developing as in uh, uh, in our um, political uh, culture, but the EU is coming here and expecting us to do in six months uh, what in Europe took two hundred years." So perhaps with this level of ambition of promoting democracy, human rights, we're talking about so profound cultural changes that probably the EU should arm itself with a little bit of strategic patience 
and at the very least, um, not let specific uh, communication line destabilize narratives that give rise to um, some of these more, I think, I do believe, but that's my opinion, of course, uh, virtues, uh, virtues of um, human rights, good governance, and um, international politics, not based on the hardening of borders, but on multilateral cooperation and uh, regional integration. I'm not sure if I went over my time uh, as any university professor, I probably have the, the ability to speak uh, a lot and too much, um, but thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and I will now be very excited to hear about uh, your views on this, uh, this very interesting topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, your uh, presentation was very informative and uh, I think that it uh, greatly opens the floor for our next speaker. That would be Yorgo, Dr. Yorgos Kostakos. Christos, yes. Yes. Yes, Yorgos Kostakos. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christos and Nikos, and for the invitation and the opportunity to be with all the other uh, fellow speakers here and with the rector in presence. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, I wanted, what we heard was more an academic presentation. I will speak, uh, as Christos said, as an engineer, perhaps, <laughs> just practically what for me and as a practitioner at the UN before, what some of these things mean. And they are very much connected to what um, uh, Stephen said before, uh, but in a different kind of a presentation, I suppose. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, this uh, COVID-19 experience, uh, I think probably helped the EU come out in a more positive light in terms of dealing with the, conf with the crisis, not the conflict, with the, the pandemic, because initially it was each of the countries going it on their own, but eventually somehow it was wrapped up with the vaccines centrally uh, procured and provided by the European Union, although there are problems in their distribution, etc. still there is some positive work and image there. Uh, the 750 billion of the rehabilitation with fund and all that, which uh, Stephen uh, called uh, like um, financial, uh, federalism or something. Uh, it's, it's a, I'm also a federalist uh, in my uh, other, one of my many hats. Um, so it is an ideal of a Europe working for the benefit of its citizens and uh, strengthens that, that image of the EU. Uh, while at the same time, while doing these things, not um, abandon human rights, let's say in the process of dealing with the pandemic, uh, in general, not perhaps every country, Hungary uh, and a couple more perhaps excluded, but uh, the center certainly not uh, leaving the green deal behind and all that. So we see European Union that compared to the US, which is a federal state, uh, the US under Trump in a way fared worse than the European Union under uh, von der Leyen and Michel uh, during the pandemic. To go back a bit and, and see what we're talking about, the, the public diplomacy, as also Stephen said before, it's quite often more aimed at the interior, especially for insecure entities which uh, their, their founding myths are under attack or uh, let's say they're not fully gelled. Like, because if you ask most people, I don't think that they feel the direct link to the European Union perhaps more primarily compared to their national or other uh, regional identities. And that's something under construction for a long time. Um, I'm not sure how we will get it right, but I can see why people don't uh, associate fully and they don't give the legitimacy that the center would like to have. The, the establishment of a European ideology, what makes Europe Europe has many elements mentioned earlier. I will refer to some of them. Um, like it is, yeah, for, for, for human rights. It's like a small UN, uh, like all for good things. I find it um, basically um, uh, pretentious and unhelpful in general. When the European Union does that coming from the UN, uh, I see somebody trying to usurp the role of the UN, uh, which is really a global organization with its 193 states and covering the whole world by a 27 now member state um, organization or entity of some sort, which pretends to be the UN because it has more money perhaps and also finances the UN and other things. So what the outsiders see basically is 
a European Union that they can benefit from for development assistance and has all these good signals that sometimes put pressure on them, like on the Arabs or others in theory, but in practice, the interests of its member states, uh, of France in, in Africa, let's say, of uh, right, uh, Germany with China and its uh, export deals and, every, and everything else. So people can see this dichotomy. What eventually emerges is that there is a bureaucracy in Brussels that wants to believe it is a small UN and creates this myth that is not bought even by its own people or it's bought partly and we're nice, but the others don't uh, reward us for that. The latest ideology uh, for me is the European Green Deal is a way of uniting interest and um, having this um, attraction of a superpower. Uh, because the other ideologies, the West is supposed to be more the US that is, uh, speaks on its behalf. Um, let's say other issues have been taken up by others or they're more authoritarian, so they don't fit the European model. So what it's left is this European Green Deal that at the same time um, takes space and says, we care about global issues and climate, and we do. It's not that it is all pretending or anything, uh, but it's used beyond its uh, environmental and climate elements, and also a way to revive the economy of the European Union uh, by uh, creating a new uh, growth area, which can, of course, be overdone, like now windmills everywhere. In Greece, I think we're getting to the point as much energy as we could from windmills we have already or it's planned, but the windmill construction continues, including in Denmark, and then uh, the export and the companies that want to install them. So uh, it is this ideology then, and, and the um, public diplomacy that follows it, has positive elements and some uh, not so positive uh, hidden elements. But overall, it's very positive that it also now with the new administration, the US can lead, lead to more action to, to, um, to address climate change, which is a real issue, a global issue. Also, um, this, um, the, the, the EU is like a regulatory superpower. People often talk about it and academics uh, outside Europe see that it is a center of production of regulation, which eventually becomes even global because nobody else regulates, including on the GDPR and privacy, et cetera, issues, right? So that is often welcome because at least that when um, regulations passed centrally in the EU, then it goes to member states, and because companies even from outside want to do business with Europe, then they have to comply with it and it becomes almost a global regulation. Other elements um, is um, this uh, uh, demonization of Russia in a way, a part of public diplomacy, it is becoming like uh, defining yourself against somebody else. And I think it's unfortunate that the European continent is divided even more. Russia has many problems, but to uh, play this game, which also leads to real conflicts in Ukraine, for example, uh, and, and Moldova, perhaps, and uh, there is already there a dividing line, and possibly in other places, uh, uh, like uh, can, can create real problems for, for real people. And I think that is an old style uh, diplomacy and uh, ideology building way. Um, finally, um, I think some elements of this, uh, the, the important thing is to make it gel by connecting the European Union eventually to its citizens. I think that would make it more real, not a bureaucracy idealistically acting and then the interest doing their own things. Or, um, but as um, one of the units of the world which has a regional, um, um, a regional representation, which can talk equally with, with uh, the US and China, et cetera, to represent the interests of its people and to work together for, for global issues. That kind of legitimization has not emerged yet. I hope that uh, this experience with the COVID and, its, uh, uh, and how it was addressed and also the borrowing of the European Union on behalf of everybody, maybe financial federalism will lead to something bigger. Um, but at the same time, 
we still, we're still looking for the unifying myth that will um, um, bring this unit in diversity into real existence. And languages don't help, that there are different languages are small political entities don't help. But if it can be a model like India is one country with a very diverse linguistic and other historic background that's still holding together and has a presence at the global stage. Um, yeah, I could say more, but I think let me leave it for the discussion. Thank you. Nikos? Okay. Philippos. Hello, everyone. Just unmuting my microphone. Uh, while I load my screen, let me just say it's a pleasure to be here as well and talk about an issue that I think is quite in the margins of uh, when we talk about uh, uh, EU foreign policy and so on. But if we actually think about it, uh, perhaps it should become a more central, uh, become uh, at the front so that we can reconceptualize uh, how we think about foreign policy itself. Uh, let me just check. Can you all see, uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, uh, all right. So usually in this work, uh, what, what, what I'm going to present now and share my thoughts with you is uh, to a great extent based on the work that uh, we did with Christos over the beginning of the previous decade. When uh, sharing a journalistic and international relations background, we were stumbling into public diplomacy as a sub-discipline or something like that, if you want. And we said, why is it just that we talk about communication and culture and so on? Why isn't it positioned at the center of foreign policy? If we think that it's so important for the foreign policy and for the goals of the EU, why does it just borrow and touch upon other areas but doesn't become strategic itself? So we started thinking critically about the kind and understanding and fundamentals and the philosophy behind public diplomacy, which started after the Second World War and was basically capitalizing on the success and the good branding name of uh, countries like the US, for example. And this then was uh, extrapolated into the Fulbright Institution and uh, the Farming School and how those institutions worked in a way to reproduce the good identity and branding name of different countries. So we always thought that it was kind of around in the periphery rather than spot on on what foreign policy should target and do. And we were encouraged by the fact that while in the 90s everybody was looking at the EU as the place to be, the polity to follow, the remarkable success in the uh, debate of international relations and so on from the 2000s, without expecting it a lot, we saw that the EU was encountering some problems. And more importantly, it was no more the heaven seen from the outside, as well as from within for many of its citizens or prospective citizens. So the proposal that we made was to reconceptualize public diplomacy and put it from the periphery to the center across two axes. The one I already referred to, it was strategic. Why not touch the main issues that are in the minds of the people and try to open a dialogue with them to win them over? The understanding was the following. If we like the European Union because it's a peaceful place, this was extremely important in the 60s and the 70s. In the 2010s, for many, it's not that important because this doesn't by itself make the EU distinct and better and so on. So why not take up the central issues and debate them with citizens and try to benefit from that? How it would benefit? The other axis was the how. You, would we employ people, engage people and so on? Rather than a top-down communication of sending the signal that our polity or country is very good and has a very good brand name and so on, it would try to employ people into discussions, engage with them and find out what they think, why they think about it this way, 
what would change their mind? The goal then would change from this uh, differentiated model would shift from trying to establish a good image and through that improve the acceptability and legitimacy of the policy to target straightforward the legitimacy and efficiency of specific policies. Because from the 2000s onwards, there seemed to be a break in the success of the European Union to be seen as a blueprint, to get its way in international affairs and so on. And there are some theoretical foundations for this reconceptualization. The first is that we live in a pluralist global society. We talk about that in half the world, the Western world, but even in the not so democratic parts of the world, everybody has a smartphone, a mobile phone, access to private news. When I was a kid, we only had the national public television, right? The kids, the millennials that have grown up now have a totally different understanding of what it is to be a citizen and not just of one country, but of the world. This empowers citizens, not in the sense of making better decisions, but they don't have to rely on one source. They don't have to hear a top-down message and that's it. At the same time, there has been a lot of progress in uh, political theory when it comes to deliberative and discursive democracy. We have such an empowered uh, citizenry that thinks in so many different ways that we have to engage them, both to understand them so that we can persuade them and target our messages better, but also to learn from them in many, uh, in many ways. Another development, and uh, if Calypso was here, she may have mentioned as well, is the conceptualization of uh, European Union as a democracy, as a union of democratic states who have decided to govern as one, but respective, respecting the particularities of each one of them. And the last thing is the increased value of epistemic politics. Nowadays, we employ, uh, uh, we employ epistemics and science as a guide and as an evidence base for most things. And it's exactly this conjunction with science that becomes a focal point of citizen uh, discontent. It's your science, it's not our science, your science is flawed, it uh, covers stuff and so on. So what we need to do is bring the people in to let them hear experts, to let them argue with experts, to let some of the citizens voice their concerns and some of the citizens may due to their professional capacity be also inputting into the, the scientific debate. So what is important to do is to try to understand public opinion better. The 2010s have one characteristic, the revolution of people in well-established places against their elites because they said, I don't trust you. I, I'm not persuaded by what you say. They might be wrong, but that's, that's, but that's beside the point. The idea is, I think that you first cover yourselves and want to serve your interests, and secondly ours, and I think you hide something in the process. So it's very transparent to open the process, okay? Understand public opinion. It is also very importantly, to have public fora. For example, there is an assembly of people in the UK as we speak about potential future climate measures. This as a step gives much more credence to every policy making project. And being invited into this means that, well, you see from within, you can no more just make suggestions that the process is fraud, is a fraud and so on, because some citizens are part of it. Of course, this only can only target at this point domestic audiences, European demi, rather than publics of uh, third countries. Thirdly, we have to understand and synthesize the data and try to organize, fourthly, people's opinions in frames. And I will elaborate on that in the two case studies that are going to uh, be discussed towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so the two the two potentially positive outcomes from such a reconceptualization of public diplomacy would be to understand people better so that you can create more tailored communication to them 
and more fragmented as well, targeting different understandings with different messages, or also try to be reflective. Usually in policy making, we understand we have the monopoly of truth, we got it, we just have to make the others who are morally or intellectually inferior to understand. In many cases, bits and pieces of our policy and our formulation can be improved and to adjust to reality and be much more receptive by people. So, what are the tools? Deliberative fora engage people to make them part of the policy making process. Create hubs of discussion so that you can bring forward a higher level of dialogue, which can have more points, more niche points, more elaborate points. As we have many students here, think of the feedback you get from your professors. If you would write your essay then again with the feedback, your points would be much sharper and niche. And if your essay is about policy making recommendations, here it is. Okay, it's a dialogue and it will lead to better results. We have an EU diplomatic service for a decade now. We didn't in the past. And this can also follow the footsteps of public diplomacy's needs. Okay, engaging the people is necessary. And we can think of how the European diplomatic service can become the most advanced website and interactive uh, site of uh, international organizations and states around the world. What are the ethics behind this reformulation? Which well, is not just a reformulation of public diplomacy, but also of policy making itself. Share the dilemma sincerely. Back in March, when we were discussing the lockdowns, nobody was 100% sure. There was uncertainty of the future, but all governments come out and say, this is what has to be done, end of story. Dealing with uncertainty, with how science is going to evolve, how, for example, in the COVID-19 case, uh, the strain would respond and so on, all those are mighty in uncertainty. It is necessary to share these dilemmas and to expose the rationale and the true dilemmas and the present and the present cons. The goal is to persuade people, for example, to stay home for their own benefit and not to force them to do so. And this is fundamental because if you want good results, like the efficiency of policy, you have to make the others want to be part of it. Thirdly, the problems are global. You cannot vaccinate billions of people against their will. Of course, they will revolt. The best policy will be to try to make them see what pros there are for them. And the third, uh, the fourth element is that we want people to feel that they can run their lives. So in the COVID case, personal responsibility, if followed, is a much, much better measure rather than strict measures that everybody seeks to, uh, to break, right? When you try to implement policy, you set it out, but you expect people to implement it. So you need them in the process. It's always better to have them believe in you, to try to persuade them, to try to make them see your point even if they don't agree fully. I'm not saying that we don't have to force measures in some cases. I'm saying how we reach them, how we communicate them, whether we tweak them or not, is very much an outcome of what kind of public diplomacy we follow. So towards the end, I just want to focus very briefly on the COVID case and then on what I see a much broader challenge and it has been shared in the academias, look at the tree, but don't miss the forest. I talked before about the, the rationale and the, uh, the imperative of understanding and taxonomizing citizens' responses and uh, uh, cultural uh, reactions into frames. Many people are skeptic when it comes to the whole reaction to vaccination, okay, or the lockdown measures. If we just think that everybody rejects them for the same reason, we are very far away from understanding their reaction and putting in place the right messages and also the right policy. 
So for example, some people say, look, nothing should take my personal freedom to go for a night walk when I'm not harming anyone, okay? The other thing is, look, I feel healthy. Science has shown that I'm 25 years old. I'm not going to, to suffer. The possibility is very, very rare. You have to understand that when it comes to my personal calculus, I'll be fine, okay? And if I want to do things with other people who are 25 or alone, again, you cannot stop me. Others say, look, I need to work, otherwise I cannot survive or my family cannot survive. So setting professional professors in the market is the number one priority for me, okay, not to shut them. So we have to understand those reactions and target our public diplomacy messages. Only this way can we understand people, talk to their worries, and also try to have them in the discussion to see how we can improve because the person who needs to work and is 60 years old doesn't want to fall sick either. He, he's forced to prioritize somehow. And of course, it's very important to provide responses, but have them in the process, listen to them and work on this feedback. In spring of the previous year, when, of course, COVID was everywhere, we were saying that COVID may not be with us in two years. It's the priority for 2020, but this has, must not sideline other priorities. So the biggest priority for our generations, and I'm very glad that this came up in, uh, in your presentations before, is climate change mitigation, sustainability, and by sustainability, I mean true sustainability, not just having any, a good climate policy that will reduce emissions, but reaching carbon neutrality, meaning no emissions well before 2050. All official goals are goals government set to, to look as if they are doing something. If we're serious about climate and averted catastrophes, we're talking about 15 to 20 years maximum with current scientific uh, uh, understandings. So, and here things are much harder because all governments, the European Union, have to persuade the climate skeptics and negators, but also people who say, what are you doing sitting on your chairs and not changing everything? Again, you have to analyze people's reactions into frames, tailor messages, have people in the discussion of what they think is the priority. Is it employment? Is it a secure climate? To what extent and equilibrium are we talking about both priorities? And follow this to an extent. So it is very important to think that the people are an inherent part of the whole process and that we need to put them into the process so that we understand them better, tailor the messages, but also improve the policy much more ourselves. I don't want to eat up any more of uh, everyone's very precious and scarce time at this point. I'm just concluding uh, saying that uh, we have been calling for uh, a retailoring of uh, public diplomacy along the strategic and discursive axis. The understanding is that we understand, we need to understand the publics better. We need to take on the skeptics, but also benefit from the popular input. We need to make policy with science and people, not uh, with science against the people. And I think this is a focal problem of governmental policy making and public diplomacy within the EU and around the EU. And this kind of public diplomacy is not value neutral. It embraces the logic and the ideal and the vision of a more participative and hence more legitimate policy making model. Because when you employ people, then people cannot complain that much that, well, this was thrust upon us. As long as this is done well and properly, you can have people as part of the process. So they cannot just blame the governments and the European Commission and so on. 
I think that my presentation is more into what the EU should do domestically to convince its people, its own demi, to get the vaccination and so on, to get climate measures and so on. It is hard, realistically speaking, to target Chinese people, Russian people, and so on through EU public diplomacy in the same model. But those are hard cases. We can start with neighboring states, with more amenable policies, try to put the message across, and also try to spread it. And as we say, the more we have a pluralistic society, I'm running an MBA global course, for example, with hundreds of Southeast Asian students, and they are exposed to the messages of the West and the UK and the European Union, okay? And they will become carriers of these messages back to their homes and so on. So it, there is a global society. And with the movement of ideas, EU public diplomacy can travel far away, okay? And try to chip in the main goal to the main goal and ideal and vision of the European Union in the 2000 in, in this century to remain peaceful together and improve the state of the world you referred George to regulation beforehand in climate change in telecommunications in high tech and so on I'm very surprised for example when I hear people just blasting against the European Commission and Google and Facebook and so on, but they don't see that the European Commission is the only actor globally who can put a break and protect their data and the abuse of these companies. So those things can come at the fore, and there are many young people who are very concerned about high tech and Google and so on, how they work. So if we tailor our messages there, uh, I think that we can embrace a pathway of more open, participative, legitimate, and hopefully efficient public diplomacy and policy making model for the EU. I'll draw that to an end now. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Would you be kind enough to stop sharing the screen? Yeah. And uh, Nikos? Nikos, good morning, Nikos. Any case, um, until Nikos comes back, do you have any questions to for the speakers? Mary. Good afternoon, first of yes. all. I've just uh, attended uh, the last uh, Mr. Ah. Kostakos and. Uh, uh, the last one uh, uh, participant of this uh, meeting. Uh, first of all, as uh, I thought, it is extremely interesting um, what uh, would be the meta crisis uh, scenery in uh, Europe and generally. And I think uh, all this that I have uh, heard until now, except you, excuse me, Mr. Professor, uh, they were extremely interesting. Thank you very much for this uh, for this meeting. Um, I will go back to something that George said, George Kostakos, that uh, if we are hard with the Russia, we define the U.A. the U against some uh, someone else. Yes, there is a point there. Uh, yes, we do create problems for uh, real people. But uh, we are also a community with certain values and, and principles, you know, and we need to defend those. For example, uh, I think it was Stefan who said that we, we are bad in uh, Hungary and Poland all the time. Yes, we are. And rightly so, but we are not doing it in the right way. Mr. Nikos came. Yes. yes. Uh, Gor Timothy Gordon Ash. I will be the coordinator. <laughs> yes. Timothy Gordon Ash uh, wrote an article recently saying that what is a danger for the EU? The exit of a democratic country like Britain or the continuous <laughs> participation of illiberal or non-democratic countries like, uh, uh, like Poland and, and Hungary. I think um, 
we were too soft on that. Uh, issues of uh, democracy and you uh, European uh, and human rights and the state of law should be not negoti negotiable. I mean, if the Commission and the European uh, Council cannot act as protectors, you know, of uh, our basic principles. Uh, and I ask a provocative question. Uh, what, what, what is the impression, you know, that we give to countries outside uh, Europe when we talk to them about human rights and uh, democratization and so on? Can I ask a provocative question? Yes. When uh, we see that European citizens still fail to understand core issues of European Union, how is it is to develop a European public diplomacy doctrine? When inside the, the European Union, we still di didn't actually clarify where we wanna go. So how, how we can actually portray our, ourselves as an organization yeah. that, yes. I do have an answer on that. Uh, uh, people uh, find it difficult to understand core issues of the European U Union, just as they find it very difficult to understand core issues of their domestic politics. Uh, okay. One is a reflection of the other, but um, yes, but if one you side say about this, you will say that Sandorini, Acropolis, yes, Acropolis, yes, but, but, this is but we do have to understand, and th this is the logic that I I strongly share with uh, with Philippos Proedru is that uh, there is a domestic side to public diplomacy and this has been you know it's been discussed now in, in academic circles uh, you have increasing uh, networks of cooperation and exchange of ideas between you know domestic civil societies in within and with other european countries that is important and that we we should be we should build on it um i don't think that people don't understand the core issues uh, and the crisis illustrated this you know uh, we want more europe now it is not that I, they don't understand it uh, it's a nice boxing box you know okay uh, let let the other ones uh, respond to the question how yes. to have a public diplomacy when the organization itself is still looking for this identity who wants to take first the question okay let stefan answer mm -hmm. yeah okay just uh, thank you for for putting a very easy question uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no i don't have a good answer to this um but I want to start from the observation that i mean um the european union has always uh, been read in different in different countries and the different uh, among different groups um, as being about very different things. Um, and one of the things um, that has um, in this reading uh, also to be a little bit provocative that has actually um, managed um, to put a ground for the European Union to um, advance towards more cooperation, more integration um, has been the absence of a Europe-wide uh, dialogue. Um, uh, because um, you can read something different into the European Union in, in, in Denmark, in, in the United Kingdom, uh, in Spain, and, and, in, in, and in Belgium, there's been room for uh, federalist, uh, very sovereignty-minded free marketeers. Um, there's been a room for, for everybody. I think... Um, Obviously, there's a crunch time at a certain point, uh, and I think the European Union's own development uh, is now obliging us, uh, obliging the EU as a unit to take a stand. Um, um, why is it that we automatically expect that the EU should do something about COVID when it doesn't have competences in terms of health? Um, I think there is this um, increasing agreement um, so, I mean, the only, the only solution I see uh, is to communicate. Um, I mean, there, 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 is a, there is a case for tackling all the great questions. 
Um, but there's also a case for um, yes. the opposite, um, in the sense that, uh, at least to foreign publics, you can communicate about all the non-controversial aspects, and that can actually be done pretty well, and it might be an effective use of money. Um, I'm, what I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a, a, a democratic debate internally, um, but uh, I, I, I see them as uh, very difficult uh, to install in, in, in public diplomacy also because we see this in many times, um, also on digital platforms that we can get a lot of users uh, to debate a new narrative for Europe, uh, as been the case in, the, in, in previous years. Um, but the profile of those who participate there um, are very, very, very similar. We don't really get a, a, a true democratic debate. Um, just like we don't get them on social media, the algorithm put, puts, puts us into bubbles where we all agree with each other. Um, so I think um, there are both technological and organizational problems um, also underlying this. I know I didn't respond at all, um, uh, but I think it's, 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 um, it's definitely um, a very relevant question, uh, what we can do and, 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 and then of course uh, afterwards, how can we do it? Um, as a separate question. Thank you. Um, Dr. Philippus Proedru. Yeah, I think I would agree with Stefan and Christos to an extent. Uh, there are controversies uh, underneath all consensuses. I don't, it really depends when you are look, where you are looking. The EU does stand for a lot of things that others do not. Uh, peace, democracy, and so on. And uh, I have never seen in history 28, 27 our states being for decades, 25 of them stable, democratic and so on. Two of them having uh, rule of law problems for a decade. And uh, we are complaining because the central institutions of the EU is not scolding them enough, but still uh, they are working at much higher standards than the average of the world. I think that this is exactly the oxymoron on our public attitudes against the EU. The EU is remarkably good, and this is why the expectations are very high, and when it doesn't meet our expectations, we're complaining. And uh, compared to Greece, for example, uh, Christos came from the south of Greece and is always making jokes about northern Greeks. And in a very anecdotal way, there are a lot of differences, right? I mean, our football championships a century ago were divided into the south and the north. Every government comes in every three years on average and abolishes a lot of the previous policies. Do we all agree what we should do as Greeks in the Aegean? Sorry, Stefan, if it becomes very Greek-centric. I just think I speak to most of the people in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, it is remarkable that the EU, for example, did put in place sanctions against Russia. And you highlighted how difficult Russia is as a partner and how divergent the policies have been. So I think that the EU is managing to be consensual, but we expect way too much when the member states have not given it more competencies. The main uh, bone of content is foreign policy and defense policy. Why isn't the EU doing that? There is not an EU in foreign policy, defense policy as there is in competition or the common market. So it's very unfair to talk about a problematic EU foreign policy when Britain and France and so on, for example, say, are you kidding me? I'm going to keep my seat at the Security Council and I don't want to federalize uh, the EU at that level. And we're talking about one of the great democracies in the world, the UK, and a couple of years ago, there has been a great scrutiny against its arms exports in Saudi Arabia. All those divergences and internal contradictions exist I don't know why the EU is at the spotlight of those. This may speak truths about what the EU has managed and may manage in the future. The fact that we're asking way too much about it. In Greece, we had a very bad time with the EU. We didn't exit. I, I don't think the majority wanted to exit. Can I add something to that? Even suppose even that the EU had an army of 50,000 people. Yeah, yes. I, wa I want to say something to Proedru, we have a discussion. Even if it did have an army of 15 to 20,000 people, or right, soldiers, what would it do 
in Crimea, in Ukraine, you know? These are questions that we need to, to consider. The European Union is an example of a, a, a normative superpower. You know, it's, it's a very good historical example of how people and, and countries can come together and resolve the, the, their conflicts historically, okay? The problem, however, is I think the, the, the heads of state and government, when they should be providing legitimacy to the European Union, they don't, you know? They come back to their countries and they will either say, I battled, I bargained for the good of my country and I won, or if they don't win, they will say, I tried, but those, you know, stupid guys in Brussels did not allow me to. So th this is, you know, this is an issue. Uh, and this is why we are fighting uh, through public diplomacy or not public diplomacy to have the citizens have more say, you know, that time requires it. You know? Because if we don't allow the citizens to have more say, the gap between those who know and those who don't know, which we create as elites, and I am not a populist, okay, but there is a gap between those who know and those who don't know, will lead to more capital hills. This is my, uh, uh, and you're, we, we don't discuss this. We don't discuss this. Okay. okay, I think George. George, yes, please do. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think we have to admit that the connection that the European citizens have to the European Union Center is still more rational. And in that sense, you can see the benefit of being part of the European Union. You don't want to get out because of the subsidies, because of these policies, but you don't have still the emotional attachment that attaches you to your nation state or to your region. And that you lose out in cases of emergency. Let's say when, if you don't have also an army, somebody take care of you, we saw it at the beginning of the pandemic, then you go back to your nation state where you feel secure. The, the leaders at the center of the European Union have not managed or have not tried or have not been allowed to create this myth, a unifying myth really that has an emotional element also. Somebody asked me, could it happen in Europe? What happened at the US Capitol? That some people went there and demanded that the election results be annulled, whatever. Would anybody do it for Ursula von der Leyen's election or something? I don't think so. People don't care that much. They don't have this attachment. They would might do it in front of the protests would happen in front of their uh, parliaments or the presidential palaces or the king's palaces. Here they would fight for, let's say, more uh, common agricultural policy this or more lobbying uh, companies that. That's one thing. So you need an emotional attachment and it's not there. There is something like you, you were European, broadly speaking, but you feel it when you're outside. When I was in the US working for the UN, I usually felt closer to my European colleagues and you can see that uh, even for human rights and political correctness, you have a different approach than the Americans who are also West in theory, but it's different. You may be closer to Canadians or something, or, but you can see that uh, and you feel proud to, uh, to be European, although you know that Europe also gave to world wars and a lot of bad things to the world, but you, you remember the culture, you remember the good things. Now, in addition to the people, what has not connected fully in Europe is also the elites. If the elites refer to the center, meaning the economic elites and other elites, then they would help also build up the center. Still that elite protection and elite reference is still unfortunately at the state level, I think. Let's say companies like, um, I don't know, Shell or whoever would go to the Netherlands for, for protection, etc. Total would go to France. Um, others, even the, uh, the scientific elites would not explain it centrally, but they would say it in their language. So I think there is a problem there of acculturation, uh, socialization and uh, merging of elites so as to make the center the reference point 
also for the citizens. And an effort like Macron was for the conventions to have these right citizens conventions, etc. What happened to that? Even that, which would be perhaps a process more than substance, is not happening because of COVID also, but because of differences in how exactly to, to implement it, which shows what the council wants, which the council is the leaders of the states that want to be their ultimate deciders of things. That's why they fight for the elections to be elected and not to give up their power to anybody in the center. And, and the parliament, the European parliament also has its own tendency to grab in its own way things. So yeah, uh, there is a disconnect at the elite and the people's level and this lack of um, human soul for the EU, for me. Thanks. Can I uh, make two points? Two points. I think the, the pandemic has made us more cosmopolitan and don't forget that this is a global challenge, the first of the 21st century. It is not an economic crisis that concerns one or two countries. Okay? Uh, it's not an earthquake. Right? It's a global challenge that concerns everybody. And we are thinking in that direction. Okay? The fact that uh, uh, Joe, Joseph Biden yesterday signed the third executive order to deal with the climate is an indication. You know, we are realizing where we are going. Now, as far as national attachment and the, <coughs> the European attachment is concerned, don't forget, and this is an example I always use from history, but one of the most, the champion of cosmopolitanism, which was the philosopher Kant, he never, in his 86 years, left his home city. Never. Don't forget that, you know? So, uh, and the third point I would like to make is that there is a lot going at the level of civil society between Europeans. Unfortunately, this is not a sexy issue for the media. Neither is it a sexy issue for the for the for the politicians. We we mustn't for, for, for uh, forget that. There was a researcher, uh, Stefan Allen at Clickandale uh, Institute, who started working on this. She died. You know. You know. You know that Allen. Yes. I was so sad about this. You know. So uh, we have to examine that, we have to look into that. It is not just, as I usually say, the gray men or the, 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 the men in gray suits or the women in, in, in gray uh, tailleur, you know, whatever, uh, discussing our future behind closed doors. That, that's, that's, I think, is, is a myth. And uh, Philippos provided you with a lot of theoretical foundations as to why it is possible, you know, to see it uh, differently. And I would go back to the 2019 elections of the European Parliament. The populists, uh, you know, although we were expecting them to gain very, gain very high percentage, didn't. And we were surprised with the results that the Liberals and the Greens got, you know. And uh, they are uh, discussing and putting on the agenda issues that are of, of global in character. So we mustn't be that pessimistic. Okay. Uh, A positive thing, Christopher. Yes, I. We are all Europeans. It doesn't matter if we are Greek, Spanish, you know, and uh, I went to New York and Washington, uh, you know, in 1989, 90, you know, and uh, I stayed there for six months. When I came back and I touched London soil, London soil, you know, not Greek soil, I said home, sweet home. So 
we have this tendency to expect too much from the European Union, you know, and to forget what the European Union has done for, 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 you know, for the continent or for the rest of, of the world. I was reading yesterday that since March 220, it has um, given the developing countries 37 billion euros in aid. Did you know that? So this is something, you know, we should, it's not, it's not the case. The money is uh, the case. The problem is bigger that the trade conditions and other things don't allow those developers yes. to develop. And most, a lot of this money goes to European consultants for European funded projects. So it's yeah. not as good as it sounds, <laughs> just to be honest. So it is only us who have the Jean Monnet chairs that don't get paid well enough, yes? <laughs> Any case, but uh, we should not be very pessimistic. Uh, and I think uh, all of the uh, presentations today were in that direction. I I loved your model, Stefan. It had a lot of uh, elements of pragmatism and realistic. Yes, you are right. You know, of course. Uh, and. Uh, you should expand your model and, uh, you know, we'll think about something in any case. Okay, um, we'll give you at some other point uh, an hour or two to, to present this model to our students if you want. Uh, George is very right, you know, when he talks about the European Union being pretensions on, on, many, on many cases. Yes, I said the European Union, apart from principles and values, also has interests. Okay, uh, so we have to find some way of combining hard power and uh, soft power, which they call now sh uh, sharp, uh, not smart power. Any case, so there is a lot to do. Nikos, Puno Nikos, Nikos? Yes. Okay, so yes. Yes. we would like you to say something on, uh, on public diplomacy. Your yes, opinion, I what do you think? I, I, I think that when an organization to that extent, uh, if we ask m most of the people that they are outside of European Union, how they see, how they view European Union, they will say it is about prosperity. Other this prosperity is money, other this is uh, freedom of mov movement or whatever. This prosperity though, or some aspects of it comes and contradicts with uh, current, uh, let's say, policy initiatives, like turning the uh, European Union into fortress, for example, that tends to be a dominant element. Um, and I, so I think that uh, beyond this prosperity public diplomacy model, it should be added equally other elements that um, that that will that will deal with European Union uh, as a political factor, for example, as a stabilizing factor, as as an organization that uh, um, that uh, has more than money to contribute. So it, to that end, it is critical. Um, the decision that has been taken during um, the last years for the European Union to build to build up its uh, autonomous strategy to become a more autonomous political factor. To what extent yes. this will this will uh, be influenced from various factors from. Um, but for, from uh, especially the election, the coming elections in Germany and also in France. But public diplomacy in general, I will uh, include it in the context of the Western world. What, what public diplomacy for Western world stands for? An element that, uh, that um, aims to, 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 to respond to extremism, to, to respond to social injustice, and especially to, to respond to two emerging and important issues that relates with green economy, which is a, a very important uh, 
tool that can be used also for, for, for uh, public diplomacy issues, and also for European uh, Union being at the forefront of protecting the personal data and uh, also corresponding to emerging issues about how we will deal with uh, big conglomerates, tech, etc. I think um, that uh, we will have now a final say and in order to summarize and uh, finish our today's webinar. Let me start from our guests. I will start uh, more, uh, firstly from uh, Dr. Yorgos Kostakos and then Filippo Spreder and then to Professor Rasmussen. Yorgos. Yeah, thank you. Um, we can be critical and I think one of the union is that we care about the union and we want it improved. So at the same time, we're studying it at the same, but we are also trying to push it in a direction which is more positive for everybody and to connect it more to its people. Uh, we have to see that uh, somebody somewhere thinks about advancing this, uh, let's say, unity uh, more uh, than the diversity in the European Union. And the, the fact that it was taken advantage of the recent pandemic to deal with issues of health, which are not the responsibility of the Union, for example, or this thing about uh, the 750 billion fund uh, where the Union uh, borrows money for everybody are important, very important, I think, advancements, and we should not uh, underestimate them and the signal that they give. So I don't know if there is a mind behind this that really builds the Union uh, again, because I think we had a period of uh, going down, or it is the necessity that pushes towards it, like, let's say, and, and functionalism, neo-functionalism, then the function comes first and then the political institutionalization comes next, we'll see. But I think we have made important steps recently and we should not underestimate them. I hope that the political leaders at the center would also prove to be adequate for the circumstances and take upon themselves an independent role according even to their compared to the countries of their origin and to really, um, uh, let's say, shape this identity and the attachment of the citizens and of the elites to the center. And of course, even if Europe is more united, it can be good and bad policies. We can always debate about specific issues, but at least we should not uh, uh, doubt that it's uh, unity. And I think we're, we're getting uh, more positively on, onwards, moving in a positive direction somehow. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgos. Philippos? I think that we have to situate uh, the European Union and European Union public diplomacy within the contours of the current global system and take stock of the EU's achievements and what it needs to do right now. We have to understand, and I very much agree with Christos, uh, the EU always had values and interests, but its interests were covered under the NATO security umbrella under the first decade of the end of the Cold War or through enlargement, once its values and its interests could not go together in a very easy way, and once the EU's interests would not just would feel like that, as we see in, in Eastern Europe or in Turkey, we have to understand that the EU has to cater for its ontological security in order to go on. Think what will happen if we have a crisis in the Aegean and the EU doesn't have the capability to defend its borders. This might realistically be the start, the start of the end of it. So it's of utmost priority for the EU to stand uh, and defend its own borders and security. The public diplomacy and the participative model is about harnessing this unity, giving answers to other kinds of challenges like the vaccine, climate change, and so on, and trying to open up to the world. And I think the main message is that everybody prefers a united Europe to a disunited Europe on all sorts of global issues. And it prefers Europe to be a driver for the solutions rather than a source of the problems as, we, as Europe was for centuries. Thank you, Filippos. Uh, um, Stefan, Stephen. Yes, um, for me, this has been uh, very enriching. Um, I think uh, I agree very much with this conclusion that uh, probably uh, a lot of the pessimistic voices we always have uh, 
um, is due to this high level of ambition, undoubtedly because we so much wanted to succeed, right? And whether we politically disagree in one form or another, but I think um, we wanted to, to, to succeed. And I think also, I mean, uh, what we're proposing, and I found uh, Filippo's uh, presentation uh, very, very stimulating in this respect. But I think also we have to recognize that it's it's very um, being very ambitious on the EU's behalf again, right? Um, the EU model is, is um, as George also said, it, it, it's based on not dealing with all the uncomfortable issues, right? Not dealing with Russia. We don't do that. that the, the Americans and NATO will do that from the very beginning, right? So um, we have a system a political system in the EU that does not handle um, very large disagreements very well. Um, it's it, it's something. It's built for consensus seeking. It's based on talking a lot. It's built on the bureaucrats doing their thing. So I mean, um, France and Germany did not sit down after the war and talk about their future uh, security relationship. No, they started trading instead and, and and developing common standards for the curvature of cucumbers and so avoiding the topic. So what we're proposing here is 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 really a radical break with all of this and. I think also what we are actually wanting the EU to do is to assume core functions of the sovereign state. I think also in a larger perspective, because that means somebody else will have to give them up. And I think I'm not a historian, but um, I, I, I just can't come to think of many times a state has voluntarily given up um, its own core functions. And this is what we're asking um, the European Union to do. So, um, Probably, uh, I also think we should really uh, stress the positive instead of contributing to this capabilities expectations gap, um, um, which I don't think will, will really get us um, anywhere. Um, personally, I'm happy that uh, I am able to uh, live and work uh, in another European country. Um, I'm not so happy I have to give up my voting rights in the process, but uh, you know, uh, cup half empty, cup half full. Um, and I think, um, Will ultimately be better off if we if 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 we recognize uh, all the positive things this brings with it, but without, of course, forgetting um, that there is still a long road ahead of us. Nikos, yes. can I say something? Yes, the final word belongs to you. Yes, don't forget that since its beginning in 1957, everybody has been talking about the end of the of the European integration project. Doomsday scenarios every day, you know. So it seems, and this is not true, you know, that we are always dealing with some sort of integrational ex existential panic. You know, you have to consider the role of the media there, the role of politicians, the role of various interest groups. You know, when the crisis abides, disappears, this panic, you know, disappears as well, and the EU and the European Union comes back. You know, <laughs> and uh, it has appeared, it appears stronger, wealthier, more integrated than ever, you know. Mm -hmm. you know look what happened to, to <clears throat> during the pandemic. In the beginning, the Germans and the Italians and the wow, 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 you know, they were imposing the trade restrictions on, on each other for masks. Two months after, you know, they signed the new agreement, the stability mechanism for development and reconstruction after the pandemic. Never forget that. So let us be positive. This is our baby. You know, I, I was born in 65, so I consider it my baby, you know? But mm. uh, I, as a Greek and as a European, uh, I cannot imagine uh, myself outsiders, you know? I think that we all agree and, uh, yes. and uh, it is time that we are more autonomous as you said you know we need to think beyond the United States beyond beyond NATO but we in can work with but on in various time, uh, western democracy values yes we can we can work on them on various issues at the same time you know as um, Joseph Nye said in, a, in his very recent book about uh, morals in international relations, and he was examining the American case, we have to realize that isolation and protectionism is not the answer, you know? Power over the others is not the answer. The answer is power with the others, you know? 
No. So, uh, and this is why we are having this seminar, we are having these webinars, and so on. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Georges very much. Every time uh, I see George, I realize how fast time goes by. <laughs> We're together 10, 30 years ago. When was that? Yeah, I'm very proud of uh, Philippos, of course. And uh, uh, Stefan, I was really surprised. I, you are very young. You know, when you read people, you often think of them as very old, you know. <laughs> but you are very young and I, I wish you the best, seriously. And uh, very soon, Nikos and I will invite you to, to develop your model. Uh, Greece, maybe. Yes. And I would like to thank my dear, not a lot today, uh, Although we were expecting 70 to 80 students to participate, I don't know what happened. But I would really like to thank my devoted followers that participated. And uh, this was nice. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you to you, Christos. Have that very much. Pleasure. Do the thank students have any questions? <laughs> no questions from the students. It's, it's next. You all agree with all three of us. Now we give the exam questions out. Okay. <laughs> 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 to the most dedicated. Okay. Good and good night and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you very bye much. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.